Hi, my name is Sarish Sudhakaran and in this video we'll analyze the cinematography of John Toll. The goal is to break down his technique so you have a starting place to learn more about his work. Toll began his career working on documentaries and chasing paramedics in ambulances. Later he got his break as a camera assistant and then as a camera operator. He learned from great cinematographers like Conrad Hall, Jordan Cronenweth, Haskell Wexler and so on. His vast experience dealing with unpredictable weather, humans, and equipment helped him work on low-budget productions without having to compromise. He landed his first film as cinematographer in 1992 on wind, when he was about 40 years old. So, as the cliched saying goes, it took two decades for him to become an overnight success. Regarding cameras and equipment, John Toll is the ideal coming-of-age story. He started with unreliable gear, shot his first movie on an Aiton, and then on was a Panavision believer. Even though he shot both spherical and anamorphic, personally he preferred anamorphic with Panavision C and E-series lenses. He carried on till about 2008 when he shot the pilot episode of Breaking Bad, where he began to use Cook S4s. In 2012, he shifted to the Airy Camp and used Master Primes on Cloud Atlas. He was one of the two DPs for the movie, each in charge of different storylines. Also at that time, he was convinced digital had replaced film forever and loved to work with the Aerie Alexa. In Iron Man 3, he used the Alexa with Leica Sumilux C Primes, and in Jupiter Ascending, he used both Cook S4 and Leica Primes. In 2016, he took his biggest technological leap, using two Sony F65s to shoot in 120 FPS with Aerie Master Primes. This was for Ang Lee's Billy Lynn's long halftime walk. Recently, he has shot Sense8 for Netflix. He couldn't use the Alexa due to Netflix's 4K requirement, so he used Sony F55s instead, this time with Cook S4s and Zeiss Ultra Primes. What I've realized reading and watching his interviews is that John Toll is probably the most direct but unassuming cinematographer today. It is a true lesson in working in the system. He has worked with many great directors, yet, he had the good fortune of being able to pick and choose his projects. He has two criteria. One, he must hit it off with the director so is in a position to contribute. Second, the movie must have an interesting point of view. The movies he has worked on have all been offbeat movies, but with decent budgets. The Thin Red Line, Braveheart, Legend of the Fall, Vanilla Sky, The Last Samurai, and so on. Each of the directors in these movies gave him the respect and freedom necessary to do a great job, and he delivered every single time. On most films, he spends a tremendous amount of time with the directors and production designer to set the visual look of the movie. With regards to camera movement, he uses everything from steadicams to dollies to handheld to that famous shot in the thin red line with the Akela crane. He prefers to keep things simple and natural. Strangely, simplicity is really difficult to achieve technically. On exteriors, he follows a realistic approach, mostly backlighting his actors. Their faces fall naturally in the shade. The effect is both subtle and gorgeous to look at. In fact, he's one cinematographer who doesn't believe in wasting time looking for golden hour. According to him, a good cinematographer should get great shots under any lighting condition. He is widely regarded for his war scenes from The Thin Red Line, Braveheart, The Last Samurai, Billy Lynn, and so on. Sometimes in exteriors, when the actors are facing away from the camera, he tends to sidelight. Whenever he needs contrast, he uses negative fill. He predominantly favors the side light even for night scenes and interiors, in combination with the three-quarter lighting style, typically on the short side. Another signature technique is the strong side rim light. His lighting of car interiors is one of the most natural looking I've seen, and it takes tremendous skill to maintain this balance. The one overriding philosophy in his style is that the source is always limited to one. This means there's rarely any fill light and the contrast ratio is typically high. As far as T-stops are concerned, he likes to limit himself to under T8, and rarely wider than T2.8. For most of his work, he tries to maintain a T-stop of T4, especially in anamorphic. It is amazing to see how these patterns have been constant right from his first feature film. Truly, he is one of the most versatile cinematographers practicing today. If you want the list of movies in this video, along with all my research material, notes, and links, then please support Wolf Crow on Patreon. I'll put the link in the description. I hope this brief video makes you curious enough to learn more about the brilliant cinematography of John Toll. The best way to learn more about him is to watch his movies and from articles in the American Cinematographer magazine. He also attends festivals and conducts workshops occasionally, so don't miss out if you ever have the opportunity.
please hit the like button to see more videos like this one. There are lots more on the way, but only if you show you want it. Bye now.